Good afternoon again. If you're milling in the back, we're about to get going here. Appreciate it. All right, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for coming out for our local law enforcement building bridges that build community. Uh, we have with us uh, local law enforcement officers as well as our security forces on base here. We're gonna provide some information and, and basically increase the communication and foster the relationship between both those on base and those off base and, and build our communities together. With this, it's my pleasure to introduce the 375th Air Mobility Wing Commander, Colonel Scott Heathman. Good afternoon, gentlemen. I really, I can't tell you how appreciative I am that you're here. Um, we've all been talking about this for a while and, and uh, to be able to have this discussion uh, an open discussion where uh, professionals can talk about things that are happening in our lives and maybe ask some questions and and uh, you know I ain't gonna lie there might be some things that certainly come up and I think it's okay to be talking um, I would rather have us conversing than not communicating at all and I just deeply appreciate that you're all here um, one quick story I want to share I, you know, I grew up in southeastern Minnesota uh, I kind of lived all over the state of Minnesota, but I, I vividly remember living up west of the Twin Cities in uh, a town called Waconia. Um, pretty close to Chanhassen, if there's any Prince fans out there, Paisley Park was just down the road, right? And so uh, I hear Prince has got a new album coming out, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, the, uh, one of the things I will never forget growing up is whether we were in town or in the neighborhood, uh, if we saw a police officer driving around, uh, it didn't take us too long to figure this out, but we would try to flag them down. Uh, because if you flagged them down, you had an opportunity to talk to a police officer. And five, ten minutes would go by, and then they would give you a card. It was a Minnesota Vikings football card. And we're like, wow, it's Ahmad Rashad, you know, or Joel Sensor, or Tommy Kramer, or Fran Tarkenton, or whoever it was. And players that probably some of you don't even know. But, uh, um, but the more times we stopped, we'd get more cards. And we started looking at the, they were all numbered. I get number 19. I'm like, 19? I gotta find 18 more police officers and, and try to get lucky to get the rest of them to complete the set. This went on for probably five years uh, when I lived up in Maconia. And I still have those cards today and I still remember those interactions. And, and, and to me, that's what community is all about. You know, whether it was the fire or police, uh, first responders, they all had football cards. It was such a little thing, but it connected me in a way that uh, I still remember. And, and, and I think we have some incredible local state uh, defenders here that have the same mentality, that they want to get out, they want to walk around, they want to see what's on your mind, they want to see what you care about, where your struggles are at, and they want to communicate. I'm blessed that we are in this part of, of the country because I do honestly believe, and I've been in several organizations having lived here before around the community, that uh, our local police here, uh, you're doing it right. And I appreciate what you do. Having lived in O'Fallon before, I appreciate all the interactions I've had with O'Fallon police and, and uh, how do you address things when we've had social unrest before, and we've had our years uh, dealing with that as well. So just to take a little moment of your time uh, out of your time to come be with us today so that we can learn from each other. It just means the world to me, and that means the world to the, to the wing. So thank you all for being here, and with that, I'll turn it over to our Master of Ceremonies. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mass Sergeant Justin Hopkins. I'll be your moderator for this panel this afternoon. I'm proud to introduce Chief Rich Wittenauer from the Charlotte Police Department. Kurt Bruggerman from the O'Fallon Police Department. <laughs> Lieutenant David Kitley and Officer Tim Miller from the Fairview Heights Police Department. <laughs> Sergeant Calvin Dye from the Illinois State Police. <laughs> and Senior Master Sergeant Tim Ogan from the 375th Security Forces Squadron here at Sky Air Force Base. Over the next 90 minutes, we hope to explore information from the local community and their respective policing policies to inform the Scott family if they are to get pulled over. We are recording this event to allow those unable to attend in person. 
We hope this dialogue will help elevate all of our understanding as we together continue to build the bridges that build our communities. To start with introductions, we will start with CMS Sergeant Tim Ogan and work our way to Officer Miller. So please, sir, uh, your name, where you work, how long you've been with where you work, and what made you want to be part of the law enforcement community. Good afternoon, my name is Tim Ogan. I've uh, been in the Air Force for almost 22 years now. Um, came in the Air Force right after I turned 18, so I wanted to be a cop my entire life. I was too young to be law enforcement at that age, so I came in the military just like a lot of other folks. Um, my intent was to do four years, get out and be an Ohio, uh, Ohio Highway Patrolman. Uh, that fell through when I went overseas, so I kept re-enlisting and here I am 20 years later. Uh, my intent is to uh, retire and do something with law enforcement at the end of the road, but Thank you. My name is uh, Rich Whitnar. I'm the Chief of Police in Shiloh. Um, I've been there uh, about three and a half years. Um, before that, I worked in Collinsville as a, retired there as the Assistant Chief of Police after 23 years. Um, I've been fortunate in this career to do a lot of uh, good things and um, serve a lot of people. Um, I'll tell you the reason why I got into uh, law enforcement is uh, out of high school I joined the Marine Corps and uh, I kind of got into the whole service aspect of uh, you know taking care of people and uh, just really wanted to serve uh, the community and the in the country and uh, just do good things for for people and and uh, be around thanks Good afternoon, I'm Sergeant Calvin Dye Jr. from Illinois State Police. I'm in my 17th year, spent my first nine years on the street, on patrol, then the next five and a half as the community media liaison. Then I spent four months in internal investigations and everybody hated me. Then I moved on to uh, where I'm at now, recruitment. I've been there for two years, uh, pretty much my whole life. You'll probably hear us all say the same thing. Um, I did really want to be a police officer. Um, you know, my ambitions was to be like a community officer, so I'm really living out my dream. I like to talk, like to be interactive, like to help people. So those are the main three reasons I got into this profession. Can you hear me? All right. I feel like I'm on. Uh, I've been on so many Zoom calls over the last year. It's, uh, that's the first thing you ever hear when anybody... Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, so it's really nice to be here because uh, this is probably the first time in a year that we've gotten to participate in something like this in person. So it's really great uh, that you guys all came out and, uh, and came out to see us today and listened to us. Because we really do, as a profession, and Fairview Heights, Shiloh, Illinois State Police, O'Fallon, we like to do this sort of stuff. Uh, you know, when, we, when you see people out, and we don't really like to write tickets. We like to do this sort of stuff. We like to be involved in the community. Uh, as you said, my name is Kirk Bergerman. I am a captain of the O'Fallon Police Department. Uh, currently, I'm in charge of the uh, patrol division. I've been with the O'Fallon Police Department ever since I got out of college, so 22 years. Uh, it's, it has been a lifelong dream of mine to be a police officer, uh, like these guys said. And I think I got into it because I just, I looked at police officers as such a noble and honorable profession. And it was something that was always so well respected in my life. And I really think it's still very well respected as well. Much, you know, against what the, the national media might portray. I believe that law enforcement is still an honorable and a noble profession. And we do really good work day in and day out. And that's why I wanted to get into it. Because I wanted to be a role model, the same role models that I saw from law enforcement. Hi, my name is uh, David Kitley. I'm currently a lieutenant with the Fairview Heights Police Department. I've been there almost 17 years now. Um, like probably everybody here, I started off as a patrolman, promoted to patrol sergeant. Uh, when I got promoted to a lieutenant, I was originally a patrol commander. Uh, before now moving over to my current position, I'm an administrative lieutenant. Um, I was also fortunate enough, I spent four years task force to uh, state police in a drug unit uh, while I was a patrolman. Um, I started my career in law enforcement right out of college, just like Kirk. Uh, went to college to be a police officer, and as early as I can remember in life, I always wanted to do it. I was that kid growing up watching cops on television, uh, watching all the police shows. I had an uncle in law enforcement that I really looked up to, and 
I think I really thought of the career as, as something that work would always be different every day I went. And it turned out that wasn't true. You're, you're doing a lot of the same stuff day in and day out. But it is, uh, you're, you're dealing with different people day in and day out. And I think that, that added level of uh, just something a little different each day uh, was what enticed me to, to the profession. Uh, my name is Officer Tim Miller. Uh, I've been with the Fairview Heights Police Department for 22 years. Prior to that, I was a deputy sheriff at a county east of here. Um, so I became a police officer right after I got out of college. And like many of these guys on the stage, I wanted to be a police officer for since a young age. Originally, I think uh, what appealed to me was carrying a gun and driving fast everywhere I went. Uh, but that uh, soon stopped when I got a few uh, complaints to the sheriff. Uh, but after that, uh, you know, you settle in and you get some experience and uh, you look forward to going to work every day. Uh, police officers, when I was young, you looked up to them. They were the good people in the community. You could trust them. Uh, I still believe that today. You know, they're, in anything, there's human beings, so they make mistakes. It's the ones that make the malicious mistakes that you worry about. So I'm happy to be here today and uh, look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you. So before we get into the panel discussion, I have to go over some ground rules. We want to make sure we keep this a respectful environment. As everyone enters the facility, you should be given a white card, an index card, and also a pet if you already have it on your person. If you have a question pertaining to one of the topics at hand, Please raise it up. We have two runners in the back that will grab that card from you and get it up here expeditiously so I can tie it into the, uh, the actual conversation going on. Any other generic questions, you can hold it up and pass it to the side. The runners will come up and collect those uh, from you and then bring it up here so we can interpret it and get into the conversation as well. So with that being said, we'll go ahead and start into the, uh, into the panel. Uh, so to start, we, we know there are many initiatives that are sponsored by law enforcement to help educate the community about what they actually do. Can you please tell us what types of programs exist locally and how someone can get involved? First Dibs gets it. Uh, so as far as the Illinois State Police goes, we have a team, Illinois Youth Police Camp, obviously. This is the second year in a row we had to cancel it due to COVID. But what it is, uh, we usually take anywhere from 60 to 80 kids from the ages of 13 to 18. Um, some of them eventually want to join the military or policing. Some are struggling to conform uh, to authority. So they get recommended by school counselors, principals, teachers. We've actually had a few that are uh, court ordered, highly structured. The main thing that the parent guardians appreciate is that there's no electronics and it's a week long residency program. They do everything from, and it's male and female. We have a male dorm. Female, female dorm, and actually, um, I know Shiloh, I think everyone up here um, has sent an officer to help the state police uh, with the camp, so we have officers from all over the Metro East, all over the state, actually, and um, I've been doing it, participating in it, in, in it since 2006. I've actually been the coordinator since 2017, and we've had um, multiple kids go on to the military or go on to policing. Unfortunately, we've had some choose, you know, the uh, make bad decisions in life, but that's one of the, the main things that we do, uh, you know, to bridge the gap between community, especially teenagers and law enforcement. And we have four of those camps in the state, one in Chicago, one in Springfield, one here in the Metro East, and it's held at Principia College down around Godfrey, and the uh, fourth one is Southern Illinois at SIU Carbondale. I'll go next. Um, so that is a fantastic program the Illinois State Police puts on. One of our lieutenants uh, was able to participate in that a couple, uh, a couple years ago and, and just gave rave reviews about it. There's a lot of stuff that we'll all talk about. A lot of us do some of the same things within our communities. Uh, you know, we have a Citizens Academy, and I know Fairview Heights does. We do, uh, what, I'll back up a little bit, but you know, one of our mission statement in O'Fallon is is pretty simple, in that we talk about educating, preventing, and then enforcement. All right, and education is always the first thing on the mind. Okay, in anything that we're going to do, we're going to want to educate people because if people know what they're if they know what they're supposed to do, they know what the law is, they're gonna they're gonna likely do it. Sometimes that's not going to happen, but. 
we always want to take that stance first to educate. So we do have a lot of different programs out there to try to connect with our community. Um, that Citizens Academy is probably one of the, one of the best that we, that we do each year. It's a 10 week look, uh, look behind the curtain into all our, our department. Uh, we ask about 20 to 25 people to come and they, they come every week, once a week for about three hours where we give them an in-depth look at what we do as an organization. Uh, from everything from the ride, uh, ride along that they do, to how we patrol, to how we dispatch, to how we deal with different problems in the community. And it's a fantastic program, and I, and I believe one of our, uh, Pamela Dorsey in the audience uh, was one of, uh, one, of my uh, one of my Citizen Academy graduates a few years ago. In addition to those, we're always looking for ways to, to reach out to the community. We have a youth academy, and I know Fairview Heights has done their youth academy for 40 years, I think. Uh, close to 40 years. Uh, we have a youth academy, we have explorer programs, we have a senior citizen academy for those that maybe can't get out of the house, we'll go to them and do that sort of stuff. We have a lot of different programs throughout the year and we're always looking for ways to interact with our community. Probably one of the ones that I was most proud of that we've been doing the last few years pre-COVID was something called pop-up barbecues where we will go into the community, into a neighborhood uh, that maybe hasn't had the greatest interactions with the police department or maybe uh, you know, some of our lower socioeconomic neighborhoods and we will barbecue for them. Uh, we'll announce it a couple days beforehand and we'll show up with the barbecue grill and we'll make hot dogs, hamburgers and just a free barbecue. Just a time for them to get out, talk to the police department, see what's going on. You know, I think a lot of departments do the coffee with a cop but you know who comes to the coffee with the cops? And we've talked about this beforehand, people who like police officers. So the challenge for us as law enforcement is to get out there and interact with the people that maybe aren't gonna come to us. And that's what we find a lot with our Citizens Academy. They're gonna come to us. So we always are looking for ways to interact with people that aren't gonna take that step. So it really becomes incumbent upon us as law enforcement to go out and try to find those interactions, those positive interactions. Hello. I'll add a little bit to that. I was talking with Kirk before the program about, about that unique scenario where a lot of our programs that we do have, it deals with interacting and educating the people that are already supporters of law enforcement. And it's, it's tricky to find that event or um, that way to engage uh, that person or people that, that aren't necessarily a supporter, supporter of yours, but they're interested enough to hear what you have to say. Um, like he said, we, Fairview Heights also has a Citizen Academy, the Senior Academy, the Youth Academy. Um, and a lot of times you're getting those people that have lived in your community for a long time, they're big supporters of law enforcement, they're just a little more curious about what it is you necessarily do on a day-to-day -day basis when they aren't seeing you out on the street. Um, and they, they get their answers when they come to that. Uh, in addition, Fairview Heights has a couple of just unique programs. I'm not sure if, if uh, O'Fallon does the RAD program. It's the Rape uh, Aggression Defense Program that we offer to women. Uh, we also do a Stop the Bleed program that we instituted maybe three years ago, four years ago. Um, and it's, it's just a, a basic uh, class that some of our officers are trained in uh, some medical first aid, some self-aid uh, application of a tourniquet and stuff. Uh, and it's just one, one more way to, to get that community involvement. People might see, see the poster, oh, it's offered by the police department. It's not, you're not dealing with law enforcement necessarily. There are police officers teaching the class, but it's just another way to, to get that community involvement outside of a negative involvement. Just to expand on, on uh, Lieutenant Kitley's uh, uh, statements, we have uh, some other ways to get the community involved we do an open house and we uh, we have in our department what's called a milo um, shooting system it's a interactive 3d system where we can put people through scenario based training you get a gun you get a taser you get uh, a flashlight a canister of mace and you can interact with scenarios that have been pre-recorded um, and uh, we've left that open for citizens to make appointments, of course, before COVID, uh, to come in and experience that, where they can kind of feel like a police officer and try to make the right decision. 
against whatever may come at them from the scenario. Uh, we also like for our, our youth academy and our citizens academy, we take them to the uh, gun range and uh, teach them how to shoot and uh, let them go through some of the things we go through uh, for our training. Rich went down shallow. So we're a little bit smaller uh, than Fairview and O'Fallon. We do, we do not have the uh, Citizens Academy as of yet. Um, however, um, at the end of this month, or at the end of May, I believe it's May 26th, um, in cooperation with the Illinois Attorney General's Office, we're having a uh, badges and bagels event, and that's gonna be at our community center, and it's gonna be geared toward uh, the uh, exploitation of the elderly as far as scams being done on them and it's going to be a question and answer sensor uh, uh, question and answer session on uh, how to avoid you know getting taken by uh, just common uh, ripoffs you know as he said badges and bagels not donuts so <laughs> we'll just get that out of there right now so we have, a, we have a question from the crowd real quick that might pertain to this. Uh, basically, uh, do you, does your organization and police in general still believe in community policing? I'll take that. Yes, definitely. Uh, it is definitely a tenet of what we do day in and day out and have been doing since the 1980s. Uh, that started with uh, one of our police chiefs, Don Slaznik, and has continued to this day. Community policing is not a program, it's a philosophy. It's how you interact every single day. And you know, it's, it's how you make that impact in your community. And we look at it as every single contact with a citizen is another opportunity to make a good impression. From, from going out on a call for service to making a traffic stop. We want to be professional, we want to be polite, we want to be courteous, we want to interact with them. So uh, yes, it is definitely something that is very strong, I'd say with all of our departments, uh, community policing is a very strong tenet of what we do day in and day out. I was gonna expand a little bit on something he said there, trying to make that positive contact when you go and you, you're, you're taking a report from a citizen. Uh, recently at our agency we discussed whether or not we wanted to explore the possibility of adding the ability for a citizen to make an online report for certain types of minor crimes um, to where they wouldn't necessarily have to have an officer sent out it would relieve our officers of having to spend the time to go out and take a minor uh, crime report uh, but one of the biggest arguments that several of our, our command staff had against it was we'll be missing that interaction with the public where we can make a good impression. Um, you know, you might have a citizen who's reporting something minor and maybe they, they just don't want to bother the police department with that and it's truly not a bother for us to come and take the report. We might be busy, but it's not a bother for us. And I think that we could probably, we're missing out on that contact if we're, if we're directing people to a website. Um, Whereas that may be the only contact that person has with, you know, a lot, a lot of citizens in Fairview Heights might go their entire life living in our town without having a contact with us. They might not get pulled over. They may not have to make a crime report with us. They may not be a victim or a witness of a crime. Um, so if this is that one opportunity, we want, to, we want to be able to go out and actually talk to that person and hopefully make a good impression for our agency, whereas we wouldn't have that with just a website. And for, for the security forces here, not only at Scott Air Force Base, but every Air Force Base um, around, is our community policing starts at the main gate um, with professional defenders greeting everybody coming in. Good morning, sir. Good morning, ma'am. How are you? Have a good day. That, that's the beginning of our community policing. And that goes on to any type of walking patrol you see our defender on, our, our canine units out doing their patrols, any type of a response, traffic stop, or even an alarm activation or 911 call. Um, all of our defenders are trained in professionalism and ethics, uh, proper ethics. So our community policing goes from the gate all the way to, to wherever we respond to. Um, another quick, quick thing for a growth and a community involvement that we have in security forces is, is mostly, um, most units have a ride-along program. Uh, COVID has really impacted that. 
but I would seek out to, to departments or security forces squadron to see if they have a ride-along program to where you can go out and ride in different shifts to get a little bit of education uh, on what they do in, in your particular neighborhood. As far as the state police goes with community policing, and I know this will probably touch on some of the topics and questions later, um, I'm not in investigations, but a lot of people on the outside looking in don't realize that the investigation for the state police handles about 95% of um, East St. Louis and Washington Park's homicides. And kind of like what Captain here, Captain Brueggemann said, that they go in the neighborhoods and have a barbecue in neighborhoods that where they usually wouldn't come in, but you know, people that, that really don't like the police. So what we started doing back in 2013, since a lot of people, um, well, according to our investigators, again, to clarify, I'm not in investigations, but they sent out mass emails, everyone with the state police, were having you know problems with people in East St. Louis, that area wanting to talk to us about these murders. We need to get out in that community more and not just show up you know, when somebody's been killed or victimized. So what we began doing um, for the last eight or nine years uh, amongst the state police, raising over $1,000 around Thanksgiving um, out of our own pocket, and we'll go down there and hand out turkeys and uh, toys. Uh, we'll come back on Christmas Eve, and um, this year when we did kids, there was eight different families with kids that lost a loved one to gun violence um, in 2020. So we went to all those houses, East St. Louis, Cahokia, Washington Park, and uh, you know, gave the kids toys and food, and that really goes a long way. You know, that you, you have no idea how much that helps now with people being more open. Uh, you know, they know the investigators' faces, and so uh, so that's a part of community policing that we started about eight eight or nine years ago. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the next topic. Um, can you please provide us the standard procedures? when conducting a traffic stop and what the expected response of the vehicle operator would be in the local community. I'll start it off. Are you looking for the uh, standard procedure for the officer making the stop or for the citizen getting yes, pulled over? Yes, standard procedure for the law enforcement officer and then what the uh, ideal conduct of uh, a vehicle driver would be. Okay, so I'll start off with this. If you're about to get pulled over, and, and this is something as, a, as an officer pulling something over, I've, I've often been asked, why did it take you so long to pull me over? Um, and a lot of times the officer's probably controlling the location of the traffic stop. You know, one of the things an officer's taught is you try to find a safe location to pull somebody over. If I'm behind you on a four-lane highway and there is no shoulder, there's no businesses nearby to, uh, for you as the motorist to pull into, I'm probably going to wait until you have that opportunity. Uh, to pull over somewhere else. Um, so typically as a patrol officer, uh, if I'm about to initiate a traffic stop, I'm going to contact my dispatch. I'm going to tell them the type of vehicle, license plate, my location uh, of the traffic stop, and I'll initiate you know, lights. Our, our personal squad cars or our department squad cars are equipped with in-car cameras, so those automatically activate when we conduct a traffic stop. Uh, at that point, I'd approach the vehicle, identify myself, uh, advise the motorist why it was I stopped and what the violation was, and I always ask for driver's license and insurance. Um, some places, depending on where you get stopped, they might also ask for registration. Uh, it's typically if you're probably from out of state, but I know most of our agencies probably are just going to ask for your driver's license and registration. Speaking from my agency personally, you can almost always expect a second patrol officer to show up unless the first patrol officer who pulled you over told the other one to disregard. So our standard procedure is at least two police officers will be sent to every traffic stop, the one who initiated it, and then a cover officer will automatically be sent, assuming the one's available. Um, as a police officer, I'm going to return to my car. I'm going to conduct a registration check on your vehicle if I haven't prior to stopping you. Uh, I'm also going to conduct a license and, red and uh, warrant check on the motorist to see if their license is valid and if they have any outstanding warrants. Uh, at that point, I'd conduct whatever uh, issuance of a traffic citation or warning that I would uh, return and explain that to the motorist and release them from the scene. As a patrol officer, uh, what we would look for in our motorists that we're stopping uh, is that when we do activate our lights, we see that you're doing something 
to show us that you've, you're acknowledging us. So if you can't pull over right away, just maybe putting a, a turn signal on, signaling us that, that you're aware of us and you're going to make an effort to pull over. Um, after that, as we approach, we're going to be watching everyone the same way, no matter if it's um, a grandma of 90 years old or uh, a young 16-year-old uh, motorist, just because we, we practice the same safety habits every time we approach a vehicle. So some things to, to keep us comfortable. Um, if you have tinted windows, dark tinted windows, you may want to roll them all down so we can see how many people are inside the car. Um, you, you won't want to make a lot of movements um, as we're approaching the car, like under the seat or grabbing things out of the glove box. Um, you can have those things ready when we walk up, or you can just wait until, until we walk up and ask you to, to gather those things and uh, hand them to us. Um, so we're just looking for things to make us feel comfortable, um, because when we make uh, vehicle stops, we have a heightened sense uh, about us. Um, so uh, we want to walk away from the stop in a, in a positive way. We want you to have a positive uh, feeling after we've, we've released you. Uh, year in and year out, a majority of our vehicle stops end in written warnings uh, rather than citations. Now, sometimes uh, that's not possible, but uh, most of the time uh, you're, you're driving away with a, a warning and hopefully a positive interaction with our officers. I, I could add that, um, you know, one of the things is it's, a, it's unfortunate that we have to make traffic stops because that's part of our job. And, and sometimes you're not going to like the outcome of a traffic stop, but it never gives uh, one of our officers the permission to be uh, less than professional or discourteous to you. So one of the things that we stress to our officers every time in that community policing is those contacts. And when we make that contact with you, uh, you're gonna, you should hear that the officer's name, the officer should identify who they are, what department they're for, and what you're being what you're being stopped for, okay? That that's what they're trained for in the academy, okay? So we should you should be able to hear hear that stuff from that officer, okay? It's okay to ask questions. It's fine to ask questions. Uh, we probably will not get into debates or arguments with anyone on the side of the road, especially when it comes to the point of the issuance of a traffic citation or something along those lines. Those type of things are, are handled in the courts and, and not usually on the side of the road. But it is definitely okay to ask questions of, officer, can you tell me why I was pulled over? And that officer should be able to tell you why you were pulled over, okay? And should be able to do it in a courteous and professional manner. And like Officer Miller said, the vast majority of our stops end in a written warning. In fact, the last, in fact this year so far, 79% of our traffic stops do not end in a, in a traffic citation. So that means you have a you know an 80% chance of walking away from that with, with a warning, a written warning. Um, with the O'Fallon Police Department, you will get some kind of documentation that there was a traffic stop. Uh, so it will be something written, uh, either a written warning or a citation in those in those cases, uh, with the officer's name, where it happened, and and what the violation was. Um, so that's kind of what, and, and like what Officer Miller said, uh, you know, when, we don't always know what you're doing in the car, but it looks weird when we see heads bopping up and down and people moving around and shaking and jiving and, you know, who knows what's going on. So it just, it does, it kind of heightens of what's going on out there because we do, we, we have a set standard protocol that all of our officers are expected to do every time on every traffic stop because they're not only watching out for what's going on in the car, they're making sure that it's safe to walk up on the car because we have, and, and uh, Officer, uh, Officer Dye can talk about this, uh, especially with the Illinois State Police, uh, traffic steps are very dangerous on the interstate. So I'm sure he probably could expand upon this a little bit. And just to reiterate kind of what they said, the approach is everything. When we're walking up to the vehicle, we're looking for movement, people acting differently. Um, a lot of the tr our training 
is focused on bad things that happen when you don't expect them to happen. And so, especially when newer officers see this, you know, they're, they got a, a little more of a heightened sense of something bad could happen because they've been trained on that. And so they're looking for, for movement um, and, and just anything out of the ordinary. Um, you know, another thing, we should, uh, the officer should always tell you the reason for the stop. I mean, if, if when you ask that, you know, it, it should probably be, you know, just a few seconds after he's in, introduced himself and, and that, because um, more than likely our officers are trained to tell you why you're stopped. Um, there's kind of two schools of thought of, of uh, if you write a ticket or give a warning. Um, I've always felt that you should tell somebody before you go back to your car and write the ticket that you're writing a ticket, rather than surprise them with the ticket when they thought they were getting a warning or, or vice versa. Um, you know, I know some people think that, um, and I don't know how, how you guys approach that, but um, you know, some people think maybe you shouldn't tell them they're getting a ticket till after you give it to them so they don't spend the whole time while you're writing it being mad at you. Um, and, and getting amped up or whatever, so. I agree. I agree with you, that's a good guess. We do that in O'Fallon as well. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, so there's a couple of different schools of thought on that. Um, another thing as far, far as like, uh, you know, most of our citations end in um, warnings as well. Um, but, you know, and I tell my guys, it's a good thing for people to drive when they're driving through town to see the, the lights going. It, it makes people aware that, oh, they are out here, they are doing something. Um, I better mind my P's and Q's while I'm driving. Um, just, uh, you know, it's been a couple of months ago, but a family member of mine called me and I was talking on the phone um, with her and, you know, she's on the phone in, the via in her vehicle and she said, oh, I better, I gotta put my phone down. Uh, one of your guys has somebody stopped. So, they see the lights, they, they see the, you know, those things going on and they realize that I've got to, you know, pay attention and drive properly or, you know, I might get a ticket. So, and it's just people seeing the lights going, uh, I think definitely uh, makes people aware of what we're doing and uh, that we're out there and, uh, and not just for traffic, but for other things. So. Uh, Somebody that might want to do something more nefarious than drive badly might think second, uh, second more if uh, they see officers out there doing their job. So we do have quite a bit of questions coming in from the crowd. So I'm going to try and tie um, most of these together to interactions between law enforcement and the community and traffic stop. So in a lot of recent events, I know recently there was a video released of the Army Lieutenant who had a, an experience that was widely publicized um, and in Virginia, um, if everyone's familiar, I think if you've seen it or not. So with that, um, it, it makes minorities afraid to interact with police, especially on traffic stops, with traffic stops and the public perception often turning quickly to violence and ending in, in the death of a, of a minority. Uh, do you believe that some of these uh, situations are handled based off race, or do you think that they show a negative trend in law enforcement systemically, or are they the mistakes of the individual? And additionally in that question, how do we make the individual driving the vehicle feel comfortable as well? And make them feel safe since the interpretation of law enforcement is to both protect and serve the community. I know it's a loaded question. If I have to go back over something, please let me know. I'll, I'll start off with just real quick. Um, so since 2006, I believe it's, that's the year, the state of Illinois has been doing uh, racial profiling or, or racial cards on every uh, traffic stop that we make. So whether you get a warning or a citation or anything like that, it's documented and it goes in, into a file on how many people that are stopped that are of a minority or you know what their nationality is. Um, so although those records are out there, um, and I don't, uh, I haven't heard, you know, much about um, factually, like how many, um, that it's a bad thing. I mean, if, if, if it was, uh, if there were a lot of people uh, of minority more so getting stopped than, than others, I mean, those, those statistics will bear it out. Um, it's not something that I check every day, but, um, they, 
Uh, so I can, I can, I know I can clear up one misconception uh, with law enforcement. About 50% of the time, and this is for all police officers, uh, we have no idea the age, gender, or race of the driver. So if I'm out on Interstate 64 and I use a laser to clock speed, and the laser can clock the speed six, seven, eight hundred feet away, so I'll walk you through it. So once I clock the, you know, clock the speed on 64 near Green Mount. 700 feet away, I got him at um, 83 and a 65 right there. At this point, I'm 100%, and it's the same way for all these officers up here when they're running speed, because you're, you know, now the car is coming at you or, or coming from your rear. If you're doing rear radar, you're focusing, you know, you're keeping your eye on that vehicle. At the same time, you're simultaneously putting your cruiser in drive, making sure your foot's on the brake, still with your eye on that vehicle. All I know at this point, is the lane that the vehicle's in, and I got my eyes zoomed in on that car. Then as they get close, now remember, we're dealing with traffic, it, even in city towns, you know, two lane roads, there's cars coming north, south, so now you're trying to enter the roadway safely. So at, at this point, that's all I know. Obviously, I know there's a driver. I don't know their race. I don't know their gender. I don't know their age. I have no idea if there's one person in the car or if there's, you know, five people in the car. Once I get behind them, it gets to what um, we were saying earlier, um, the Fairview and O'Fallon Cotton Shiloh was saying earlier, now at this point I'm looking for a safe place to hit my emergency lights while I'm calling out the license plate. At this point, now it's, in, until, up until this point, it's all about my safety and all about this vehicle, I'm stopping safety. So with, with our training, as the car's pulling over to the shoulder, now we're trained, now I'm up on the car, and even if it was a seat belt or what have you, and they're going the opposite direction, say it's 2 a.m. and uh, I'm on 161 here, out by the base, 2 a.m., pitch black, dark, do you think I know the age, race, or gender of the driver? 100% no way. Uh, so now I got the car stopped, my lights are activated, I called it into dispatch. At this point, it's about safety. I'm, I'm really, every officer is at a disadvantage. We don't know what we just stopped. We don't know how many people's at the car. So as I'm exiting my vehicle, like Chief said, there's videos right there where before the officer even gets out the car, they're being shot at by the backseat passenger with a shotgun. So all this, I mean, those are rare, but it happens. So we're thinking about, we're already in survival mode. So as I'm walking up to the car, uh, I'm trained and so are they. Now you're trying to observe, like Captain said, how many heads are in there, if they're about bouncing around. I mean, you tell me if that, if you put yourself in my shoes, would that make you nervous if you're seeing the driver's head dump down like this? You know, now you're thinking they're reaching for a gun. So once you get up to the car, you, you are a polite and professional. Sergeant died, clocked you at 83 to 60. But the whole time you're talking, you're watching. You know, even if it's grandma, you know, you're, you're watching their movements. And the, the best advice I have is, is please always let us see your hands. We're trained that that's, that's what can hurt us. That's what can kill us if we can't see your hands. I'm not saying hold them out the window, sit there with them locked to the steering wheel. You know, don't sit there the whole time of the traffic stop. You know, how safe would you feel if there's four occupants and all four of them got their hands in their pockets? You know, it just stuff happens like that. You guys see that on uh, television. As far as the, you know, some of the cases you guys are talking about, uh, like the one that happened on Sunday, I mean, obviously, yeah, it looked bad, uh, but I mean, it's an ongoing investigation. Um, I can't comment until all the, the facts come out, but I can just give you my perspective. What I experienced in 17 years, the main thing is, is show your hands, and 50% of the time, it, it's rare where I know the, the color of the person driving, the, the age of the pers person driving, and if they're male or female. We, we really don't know that and, and until we get up to the car. So I'll, I'll comment briefly on that as well. Um, it's hard, uh, like uh, Sergeant Dice said, it's hard for us to sit there and comment about other agencies and how they did something because we don't have all of the facts. And I will admit, I watched, I watched that traffic stop uh, with the with the uh, lieutenant uh, from the military, and it, it didn't look good. And um, I don't know everything that's going into it because I'm just watching the body camera footage. And and there may be an issue with training, but I don't know those officers. I don't know, so I can't hardly comment on that. But what I what we can comment is on what happens 
in our area code, okay? And, and 62269 O'Fallon, okay? And that's what we like to focus on because I can't combat what's going on throughout the nation. But what I can do and what we all can do is work within our own communities and with our own officers on how they're acting on traffic stops and what they're doing on traffic stops and what we expect out of them. And we do that through uh, watching. We have in-car video cameras. So we do monthly audits of uh, every, everybody on our department. Our sergeants are looking at their in-car video cameras to watch how they're doing on traffic stops, watch how they're treating people, watch how they're interacting. And they all, we also have body cameras. So we're also doing monthly inspections on body cameras to see how they're interacting, to see if they're using them correctly. So it's hard for us to say what's going on in other areas because we, are, we, we really have to focus on what's going on in our community uh, and set a good example for the rest of the communities. And I will tell you right now, you're very fortunate to live in this area because the police training in this area is top notch. And I have seen, and, I, and I've talked to other chiefs and other command staff throughout the country, we, get a, we have an excellent training system around here. We have a training board that uh, a lot of our officers are, uh, receive training all throughout the year. There are places in the country where their officers do not receive as much training. Um, so I'm comfortable when we have these things that, uh, that we do have some of the best trained officers, I would say, in the nation, uh, you know, especially in this. Uh, you know, a lot of people talk about, um, you know, big cities or small towns, so but we're very fortunate to, to train our officers very well. And just to touch on the training a little bit, people have to remember that it's not free. Um, I, would, I would agree with, with Captain Brueggemann that we do have some of the better trained officers in the area. Um, but there's reasons behind that. A, we're not huge departments. Um, we can be somewhat selective with who we hire. And if we hire somebody and realize there's, there's issues that we've discovered in training them, we're, we're fortunate enough that we can afford to release that officer. We can, okay, we're gonna cut our ties here. We realize this might be an issue down the road. Uh, we're gonna try and find a better officer that we think we can train better. Uh, there's larger cities that don't have that option. You know, there's cities that are probably three, four, five hundred officers short who probably can't be as selective on who they hire uh, and who they choose to let go. You know, we're, we're talking about 40, 50 man departments um, that thankfully we, we're, we come from cities that, that pay officers well enough that we get those quality candidates that we're looking for, that we know are very trainable, um, and again, if we, if we make that mistake in hiring and we realize that during training, um, all of our agencies are cognizant of the fact that, hey, it's better to release somebody early than to hold on to an officer that you think might, might be an issue down the road on how they conduct themselves. So on the, on the talk of training, there are two questions specifically geared towards training. So first, what de-escalation techniques are encouraged to be utilized by law enforcement officers in their respective organization? I'll tell you what, we, we have, like Fairview has, is the Milo simulator. And uh, we put our officers through that a minimum once a quarter, and, and we're starting to put them through that uh, once a month with different scenarios. And it's, it's like a big video game, uh, but it's real life scenarios uh, where our officers, and, and so much of what we have trained for in the past was uh, you know, you, you saw this in the academy and stuff, and, and not every call ends with somebody getting into a gunfight. So we make a concerted effort to have these training situations where they don't end up in an officer pulling their gun, because that's not real life. That's not what happens. So we work with our officers in this training scenario to work with communication skills to de-escalate. So where there may be a scenario that, uh, you know, where somebody's, uh, you know, being, uh, being disruptive, well, we're going to work with those officers in that, that, that Milo machine 
to try to use communication skills. And we have one of our, we'll have one of our sergeants or one of our supervisors that'll be in there that'll work with that officer to try to work on those de-escalation techniques. And it's all about stress inoculation. And you put your officers in stressful situations so that way, under control, so that way when they're in a stressful situation out on the street where it really counts and it really matters, they don't make those bad decisions. And we saw, you've seen it in the media over the last couple days, a very, very bad, deadly decision was made in Minnesota. Uh, the, body camera fo the body camera footage was released where she yelled taser but then used a gun. Okay, those are stressful situations that we try to put our, our officers in under control, in a controlled environment, so that way when they get out on the street, they don't make mistakes under stress. And it's, it's, it's very similar to what professional athletes do. If you ever saw Mariano Rivera, uh, the, he was a relief pitcher for the, uh, for the New York Yankees. He was lights out, I mean, always under stressful situations. He was a master at it. That's because he did that sort of stuff. He put himself in stressful situations. Michael Jordan, all of the great athletes, all of those people, they have one thing in common. They handled themselves under stressful situations well. So that's what we aim to do uh, with some of our training uh, and with that de-escalation. De and, I, and I think really it comes down to communication. You have to have somebody who's a good communicator. You have to be able to talk to people like they're a person. And once you can do that, that the situations will automatically de-escalate. So when we, when, we, when we work with our officers about how are you speaking with someone? Are you rigid? Are you speaking to them like Joe Friday, just facts, ma'am, you know? Or are you talking to them like they're your neighbor? And we find that when you talk to people that way, and you talk to them like they're your neighbor, then these things, will gradually de-escalate themselves. It's just, it's just natural for, for how, we would, how we would act. The, the Air Force is very specific in our guidelines on use of force. We have a AFI governing it, just like everything else in the Air Force, we have AFI governing our use of force. And it, and it starts all the way back to tech school. When our airmen go through tech school, they get trained in use of force on the different levels from combative all the way up to deadly force. Um, in addition to that, whenever they come to gaining their gaining unit, like here, here we have the Milo system where we put them through a quarterly training. They go through other quarterly trainings to get their, their reactions and their combatives uh, skills sharpened. Um, they go through regular firing. They go through. We have a new virtual reality training uh, training station that's in place of the Milo. It's actually in, in addition to the Milo. So we have different layers, multiple different layers of use of force training that we use for our airmen. Many other squadrons are adapting some of the same training. So our folks are going on the road very skilled and very, very trained in, in use of force, how to de-escalate, how to escalate whenever it's needed. And throughout my entire career, I've only really engaged in a couple of use of force scenarios where weapons or secondary forces have had to actually be engaged. And those were in a deployed wartime combat environment. So the folks that we have here in the security forces are pretty, pretty trained. My uh, main position at the police department is uh, training officer. So I'm in charge of uh, putting people through training, the field training program. So every day I'm looking for different training classes for our officers to attend. And every training class you go to has some sort of communication skills that, that you need to pick up on and learn. And communication is everything. Um, just like most of the complaints we feel were just a lack of communication. There was nothing wrong on either one's part, it's just a lack of communication. So learning how to talk to people is, is paramount. Um, we also have, uh, coming up, we're, we're sending two of our officers to a de-escalation school. Um, they're gonna be instructors on how to de-escalate situations. And we'll put every, every officer we have through that training uh, as, soon as, uh, as soon as they get their certification. But uh, everything starts and ends with communication. Just to add to that, de with, I like the concept of de-escalation, and it does work, but, but everybody has to understand it only works to a certain extent. There are going to be some people um, 
where you're never going to be able to reason with them. Um, especially people that may be highly uh, intoxicated either on drugs or alcohol. Uh, you, you might talk to them for 15 minutes trying your best to avoid having to go hands-on with this person in order to take them into custody. You know, and at some point you have to recognize that there is a certain level of cooperation that, that we do require from the public. I, I, can, I can talk to somebody for 10 or 15 minutes trying to avoid having to fight to put them in handcuffs, and I'm willing to do that, but at some point at some point, we do have to arrest people, um, and, and not everybody likes that, and people just have to understand that. Some people do not want to go to jail, um, and, and thankfully it doesn't happen often. Most, most of the people, we can, we can talk to them long enough and convince them, hey, this is what we have to do. Um, but there are going to be instances where, regardless of the amount of de-escalation training that an officer has, it, it's still going to result in a use of force situation of some type. Thank you. Uh, on the topic of training, here's the second part of the question. So with a lot of the interactions um, with law enforcement and minorities being largely publicized negatively in the media, uh, easily accessible from a mobile device, and in the implied fear of minorities, and then also incidents with individuals with Asperger's, autism, or even hearing impaired, uh, is there training within your organization that would incorporate diversity, inclusion, belonging, and some, or some sort of similar initiative? Can you hear me? So uh, in Fairview Heights, we have a, a autism center uh, where uh, parents bring their, their kids to go through school um, for the day. So uh, each year we have representatives from the Autism Center that, that come in and train us on how to handle their students. Um, that may be just talking to them, that may be putting your hands on them and having to restrain them. Um, but yet, you know, most officers wouldn't realize how, how to, to handle somebody who's having an episode um, until they're trained and that's, we looked at the professionals at the Autism Center to come in and, and uh, teach us some of their tricks um, to make sure that not only we're safe, but also the person that's, that's having the episode is safe as well. Um, diversity training, we, we go through diversity training after diversity training um, because we may not always know how to handle somebody of a different ethnicity, but Luckily, we have a lot of training out there, whether it's online, in person, um, to help us relate to everyone we may encounter. I'll just say, is that on? Yeah. I'll just say on that, you know, a lot of this, uh, the issues that law enforcement's having right now and, and uh, with uh, relations with the community and all, our, our mission starts at the background investigation when that person applies to be a police officer. Uh, a thorough background investigation to see any, any history of, uh, you know, not being able to communicate with somebody or, or uh, just uh, any outbursts or anything. So it starts, it starts in the background process. Um, after they're hired, they go to the police academy where they get more training on, and, you know, diversity is included dealing with people of, of uh, lower mental capacity is included, all that's included. Um, and then they go through a field training program where they ride with an officer, a uh, trained officer for three months to see if they're able to you know, continue the job, do the right things, and get more training. Um, after that, um, they have at least a year on probation where they can basically get you know, fired for any reason. Um, and so the, there's all this time for these, these things to come out. Our job is to um, hire that, that right person from day one and figure out later, you know, if we hired the right person to keep going through these checks and balances. Um, and I guess, you know, part of the issue is today, people, uh, you know, not as many folks want to be police officers. Uh, because you know they see everything happening and you know why would you want to do that job that's you know you're, you're getting asked a lot and you're uh, you know and, and some would think well they're you know cops are bad 
Um, so it's a it's going to be it's a challenge for all of us on this on this stage, getting the right people, uh, giving them the right training, and just, just to try to keep getting better. So, the, in the security forces career field, it is the largest enlisted career field uh, in the Air Force. I, I think a lot of folks might not realize that we have. 38,000 people in, in our career field. And we don't always meet our, our quota that the recruiter gives us. So a lot of people that wash out of other tech schools tend to come to security forces. So we get a lot of people um, into our career field that don't want to be cops. So part of our security forces academy, um, their agenda is to, whenever they're working through the airmen, to, to see if they're the right fit, if they're right suit. Um, and then when they get to the gaining unit, they're, they're oftentimes um, there's, a, there's many uh, security forces airmen that get discharged early just because they don't meet the, what, the, the intent of what the career field or what the Air Force needs. So there is a, there is a weeding out factor. Um, there's a lot of folks that are, that are separated because of that. As far as the state police goes with diversity training back in 2016, we started a whole new program. Uh, it's called Procedural Justice. And what they did is sent some, I don't know if uh, other departments or agencies are doing it, but they sent some of our higher ups uh, to be trained in this for like two weeks. And basically what it is, um, they get a, uh, each class, it's an eight hour class. It's very, they make sure it's very diverse. Uh, and you basically, they watch, you, sh you watch shootings and uh, traffic stops. Some that are kind of like almost 50-50, you know, then the instructor will pause it. Um, you know, was the officer right? Was the officer wrong? Um, we talk about, I mean, in some of the stuff, I'm going to be honest, it gets very heated in-house um, amongst the people in there. We're all state cops, um, you know, and they'll make sure it's, it's in each classroom session, it's people from different backgrounds, you know, um, and so people talk about their life experiences, how they grew up, um, you know, and, and what they saw when they grew up. Yeah, I mean, everybody gets along, but but you really talk some things out in there. So uh, that's the main thing. It's mandatory statewide, eight hours of procedural justice training a year. Uh, as far as the autism, uh, the, the, the big thing that they've been, the state police has been emphasizing on, that we've been doing a lot of scenarios on. Um, if you haven't noticed it, each one that gets the mic keeps saying scenarios, scenarios, training. You know, that's all we can do is put ourselves under that stress or simulate it. Like uh, Captain Brugman said, like an athlete, all you can do is practice, 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 then hope, you know, hopefully you're practicing hard so when the game comes and you're really in that stressful situation, you make the right decision. We're doing a lot of scenarios dealing with mentally ill subjects, you know, where the person's mentally ill. And yeah, uh, I'll end with, you know, I'll always ask people out of everything I'm wearing, what do you think my best, biggest weapon is? What's my go-to? Your gun, your gun. Nope. Your taser, your taser, no. Nope. Your spray, no. Nope. My mouth, my c communication. You have no idea how many times somebody's been way up here yelling, screaming at me, and just by me saying, hey, if I yelled at you once, well, no, well, why are you yelling at me? You know, and they'll tone it down. But, you know, not everybody, some people, you know, you can't fix. They'll just keep going, keep going. You know, you end up, you know, having to arrest them. But usually that's our, uh, Last option if we can talk them down. So, sorry, did I have a direct question for you? So, you mentioned. Uh, Somebody asked me a direct question? Well, not. They, no, they, not they already got beef with me? <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about issues with individuals who have uh, mental health. Mm -hmm. uh, so, do you think it would be beneficial uh, to have people who are mentally health trained professionals, like social workers, work hand in hand with law enforcement to help deal with people with mental health disorders in stressful situations? You can always benefit from that. I mean, there are, if you're dealing with mentally ill subjects on a daily basis, uh, that's your profession. Absolutely, we can gain from listening to them. And we actually do have some trainings for that, you know, uh, how to deal with a mentally ill subject. So absolutely, if somebody's the, I know I'm not an expert in that field, you know, just like a mechanic, who you gonna trust? Somebody that barely knows about cars or somebody that works on them every day. So if it's somebody that's dealing, um, with those sort of people on a daily basis, absolutely, uh, we're going to listen to them and try to see what we can learn. Our officers actually go through 
what's called a crisis intervention team training. Um, it's a 40 hour training class where mental health professionals come in and teach you about the different mental health issues you may encounter and how to handle those. You also go through scenario based training during that week and uh, they grade you on how, how well you uh, pick up on their curriculum and how well you, you adapt it to the scenarios. So we try to send every one of our officers through that. Also, as a part of that, you can also send people to the hospital who may be in crisis and uh, get them the help that they need. So it's important to remember that um, police don't really want to deal with mental health issues because they're very, very, very hard to deal with. Uh, and the reason that the police department deals with a lot of our mental health issues is because we're the only the only one open 24 hours a day seven days a week and mental health yeah and holidays and mental health mental health episodes don't happen Monday through Friday eight to four so it's it is hard um, you know when, when we talk about this to say to have a social worker because sometimes social workers aren't able to come out but I do think that it's an excellent idea and there are departments around the state and around the country that are deploying social workers with the officers. Because there are certain situations that social workers, it's, it's dangerous because people who are going through mental health episodes and crises can be violent and can be dangerous to deal with. And we will need to have police officers with them. But working hand in hand, it is a definitely a great idea. Uh, and it is being done in throughout the country in, in small numbers. And, and I think that it's a trend that probably will continue to go that way. Uh, because it's, it's not something we want to deal with on a regular basis. And I can tell you in the 22 years I've been doing it, it went from dealing with mental health issues once a week to once, twice, three times a, a day sometimes, you know, depending on how big your agency is. It's, it is a very big problem. My mic died, so I have to talk a little bit louder. Um, so moving on to another topic. Um, how does your department individually conduct investigations on officers reported on misconduct? I'll start. Um, so basically, um, if, if you had a complaint about an officer or a procedure or something that happened, um, you could call the police department, you could come up there, uh, get a complaint form, um, ask for one and one would be emailed to you, um, mailed to you, um, and uh, we would get the complaint, we, we would try to, uh, the sergeant or supervisor on duty would handle the complaint at first and uh, if, uh, if that, if you weren't satisfied with that, it would move on and, you know, maybe the, uh, it would get to my desk. Um, and, you know, it would go from there. Um, if, uh, I guess the main point that I want to get across is if, if you have, a, if you have an issue, uh, or you were treated rudely or, or, you know, complaints could be worse than that, obviously, but if you're treated rudely or if you're, uh, you know, Give us a, give me an email or leave a message for me and uh, you would get a call back. Um, a lot of people want to uh, put stuff out on social media about how they were mistreated and, uh, you know, things went wrong or whatever. And, and I'm not speaking specifically on our department, but just anywhere. But uh, did they actually uh, reach out? Did they actually uh, ask the, the officer or the, the sergeant or the chief or... Um, and because uh, a lot of things can be um, handled with just a, a phone call or a conversation or a meeting. We've been doing more phone calls because because of the COVID. But um, and I got I got off a little bit there on, on how the complaint was, but you can get a complaint form very easily by just calling um, or emailing. I'll reiterate that as well in O'Fallon. If you ever have an issue, you can always call the police department. You can ask to speak to a supervisor. You can, if you don't like what happened with that supervisor, you can ask to speak to that supervisor. Uh, we do have complaint forms. We accept complaints through email, through telephone. 
We take the complaint process very, very seriously, and we investigate anything that comes in because it's our reputation, because we know that if you have a problem with the way one of our officers treats you, you're gonna tell somebody about that, and you're gonna let people know about that, and we need to make sure that we're doing the right thing every time. Like I said before, you may not always like the outcome of something, but it doesn't give us a right to be unprofessional or discourteous to you. So that's where we come in, especially as administration. Um, as a captain of our operations, uh, of our support, of our patrol division, I, I oversee all of the complaints that would come in and internal investigations that would happen within our agency. And we do investigate every single one of them. Yeah, you know, we always look. <clears throat> we always look at complaints as an opportunity for our agency to improve or to improve an officer. I know some people are maybe hesitant to, to contact their, their police department if they have a complaint because they think oh, I'm just going to be brushed off or blown off, whatever it may be. Uh, but we we truly look at those as even though it may not be something the officer did against the law, maybe he just was like uh, Captain Brigham was saying, he was rude. Uh, well, that's an opportunity for us to improve. You know, we, we missed one of those contacts where we could have made a, possibly made a positive contact with a citizen and we turned it into a negative one. Um, unfortunately, when, when people have a positive contact with the police, we find out they're very reluctant to go on Facebook and tell the world how they had this awesome contact with law enforcement. But if they had a negative one, it's, it's almost their first stop. So um, if you have a negative contact, we would like to know about it, not from Facebook necessarily, but we'd love to hear from you about it. We have the same methods as Shiloh and O'Fallon. You can call and ask to speak to a supervisor. Um, you can come into our lobby that we have complaint forms in the lobby. You can get them from our records department. I believe they're also on our website now. One, one more thing to add, though, it, it, to touch on what he said was, sometimes our officers do the legal Thing, but could we have handled it a little bit better? And we look at that as a training pers perspective, okay? So did they do it right? Did they do it within the law? Yes, they might have, but could they have done it differently and had a different outcome? And it would have just been a little bit better. So it's a training opportunity for us as well. Complaints are, uh, are funny. Sometimes, like uh, Lieutenant Kippy said, you don't always see the good, good uh, interactions on social media um, but whenever we do I'm the public information officer for the department as well so I maintain our, our social media accounts um, so whenever we do get a complaint through our social media it gets forwarded to whoever supervisor uh, maybe over the person the complaint came in for um, and it can be dealt with it may be something as simple as hey you handled this call the person was wasn't satisfied with how they were treated and it's a learning opportunity. If it's something more specific and something that, that may require more disciplinary action, then that's going to be sent up to the chain of command for, for an investigation. Um, police also police themselves. Just because a complaint doesn't come in from the public doesn't mean your fellow officer isn't going to say, hey, through their supervisor, so-and-so did this on a stop and I thought it was wrong. It happens more often than people think. So we're also out there policing ourselves. Uh, as far as the state police goes with complaints, we have our own uh, separate internal investigations unit. Uh, they are state police. All they do is investigate uh, the troopers that get in trouble and state employees at state facilities. So basically, um, it usually always does start with a uh, call in to headquarters, either somebody will walk in and whoever is the shift supervisor will talk to them. And uh, if they actually want to file a formal complaint, they do it at our website electronically and they have to get it notarized. Once that comes in, uh, it goes straight to the captain's office. And basically, our, the captain of each headquarters is equivalent to the chief. So nobody's higher than uh, he or she. And um, I've seen from my four months in investigations, basically the captain walks it back to the internal investigations office and talks with the higher ups and in internal investigations. And um, if they think it can be handled at the captain's level, they'll let him handle it. 
Um, if they think it needs to go further, then uh, you know that they, they basically work backwards. They'll talk to all the witnesses involved, uh, get the audio video from the officer, and uh, the officer will go into what we call an administrative interview that he or she will have. Anything over 30 days goes to the merit board. We have a merit board. They do all of our hiring and firing, and so anything that they believe to be over 30 days, uh, the fate is decided by the merit board, and they're uh, made up of five men and women that are uh, not police officers, but they're in charge of all of our uh, hiring and firing. So that's basically in a nutshell how our process works. I just want to give a, a quick example. Uh, very recently, um, somebody had uh, made a complaint over social media about one of the officers being rude, and uh, this person was an over-the-road truck driver, didn't have any, any uh, contact here in this area, but he had pulled in a spot where he wasn't supposed to be because of his rig. Um, he claimed the officer was rude, um, and but that, that was it. It was on social media, and he basically said, hey, get this out to everybody. Let them know, you know, how terrible, you know, Shiloh is. Um, so I had uh, my deputy chief who does our social media, I said, does he have a phone number? Does he have anything? No, I said, well, just message him and tell him to call me or give me his phone number and call me. I'll talk to him. Um, but, you know, I haven't gotten that phone call, you know. Um, and that's why I'm saying is if, if people that have real issues um, that and maybe this person does, maybe he's just not checking his media or maybe he, he got his point across and he just wanted to blast it out to, you know, everyone. Um, but what I found is people that have real issues that want, that want to solve problems that have a, uh, well, just call me or, or talk directly and those things can be figured out. So. Yeah, so the, the Air Force has got many different ways uh, to make complaints. Um, the Airmen get taught nowadays as early as basic training how to, to make an ID or EO or, or whatever formal uh, type of complaint that they, that they feel. And there's a, being active duty, there's many other informal types of complaints where you can go commander to commander or first sergeant to first sergeant or many different avenues to get a complaint elevated uh, or laterally moved to, to my office. And, and we greatly want to be able to handle any type of unethical, unprofessional type of event that happens to one of our base defenders. Because we did, we, just like all the other officers, we want to promote a healthy, a healthy working environment, healthy base to everybody. So. We, we will handle any type of internal investigation that we need to do amongst ourselves, but in the military, there's a lot of different avenues that folks can make a complaint, just, just like the other offices. Okay. So next question from the, from the audience. Uh, how have some of the events involving police-involved shootings and perceived police brutality personally affected you? Uh, I'll take that. Um, it's it's discouraging a little bit uh, to see some of that and to see your profession, our profession, uh, to see people doing stuff like that and uh, and and to see what I still consider a very noble and honorable profession. Um, it is not to say disgraced, but to not be held in as high regard as, as I think it deserves to be because of, of the way that we treat people in O'Fallon and the way I've treated people. And, and I know that's not everybody's experience throughout this country. And uh, it angers me to see some of that because, uh, because those people are wearing the badge, even though they don't have an O'Fallon Police Department patch on them. I understand that when, when another officer does something in this country, that it will reflect negatively on me, even though they're not wearing the same patch as me, but they are a, they are a law enforcement officer. And we're very fortunate to have a, a, a community that supports us and, and we don't see that a lot. Uh, we don't see a lot of negativity towards our officers. In fact, uh, we have a very strong community and a, very, and a strong relationship with our community. 
and, and, and in fact, we see a lot of positives and people supporting us through a lot, a lot of this. But you know, I'm not on the road anymore, and I and I'm in an office, but it, I'm very cognizant and checking in with our officers that are out there that are dealing with this, that are making the traffic stops every day. And we check in with them uh, and how they're doing. And we try to provide them with all the support that they need to continue to go out and do this job because it's not gonna end. It, we still have to go out. We still have to do our job. And we still have to protect and we still have to serve our community uh, with integrity and honor. And, and it is a little tough. And I'll, I'll put it out there, but uh, you know, we're, we're getting through and we're trying to find uh, new and innovative methods to connect with our community, things like this. Uh, things like this are very important and we talk a lot about that because if you don't have those relationships built now when things are good in your community, well, when something bad happens in your community, when something like that happens in Minnesota, where that, that young man was shot, you know, that better not be the first time that you're reaching out to your community to try to build that bridge. Because that's not the time. The time is now, the time is 10 years ago, five years ago. So that's why we, we've, we've put a lot of these things into place and we've met, we meet quarterly with our NAACP. We meet monthly with a, a group called Continuing Conversation which is one of our minority churches, and we, and we talk about these sorts of things that are going on in the media. And we're building those bridges now because if something happens in our community, we want to be prepared and we want people to have that trust for what's going on. Uh, and that's about all we can, that, that's not about all we can do. I and mean, it's just one of the things that we can do to try to continue to build that trust with our community. Okay, another question. Um, since the killing of, of George Floyd and Mr. Wright and other unarmed minorities, what actions have each of your departments taken to address a problem that has perceived to have continued for years? Well, so we just, uh, we just keep continuing to train and to try, try and hire the best people that we can and to give them the best training we can and we've, uh, you know, we have what we call an early warning system. Um, it's a program, uh, basically, if, uh, you know, every time you get complained on or complimented or, or anything, it, it goes in there and, um, and, and we see those things. And if, if uh, you know, you could, basically, if you would have a problem officer, you'd be able to tell that he's got a history of, of doing things like this. Um, but uh, I, as far as you know, I can say is you know we just keep trying to hire the best people and, and train them properly, and keep an eye on them, making sure that they're you know mentally healthy, um, and making sure they're doing the job how it's supposed to be done. Moving forward, we have to use incidents like George Floyd to educate our officers. So every instance of the things like these happening are a learning experience for everyone else. Uh, show the video, um, watch it, study it, uh, talk about it as, as a police department, see the things that were done wrong, and make sure that those things don't happen. Uh, I'm going to kind of answer this current question and the, the previous one. Um, one thing that, that sort of frustrates me, I mean, obviously in every profession, police, military, teaching, um, you know, churches, you're gonna have some bad apples. I mean, you're dealing with human beings. But one thing that frustrates me, uh, once an officer does not have a justified shooting, was what you guys just asked about, how do we handle complaints? How's that handled with officers that are unethical or immoral? Well, what's most frustrating is when they pull the officer's file that's, you know, on CNN for a, uh, a bad shoot, meaning that they shouldn't have shot the person, you see, 100 pages where this person's been in trouble for this, been in trouble for that. So what, what, what's just irritating me is how is this person still a police officer and now making us all look bad? So I think uh, once you start seeing those signs, uh, you know, it, it doesn't need to be swept under the rug. The, the person needs to be addressed immediately 
Um, like any other profession, you know, it's far, just like raising a kid. It starts out small, 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 and you keep letting them get away, get away, then all of a sudden you're dealing with a deviant kid. So I, I, that's what frustrates me. That's a way that it affects me is when I see once they pull their file that they've been getting away with being an unethical, immoral officer for all this time and nothing was done about it. Uh, none of, I'll tell you right now, I know everyone personally on this panel, none of us want to work with bad cops. If they're a bad cop, fire them. We got no issues with that. You know, one of the things that we also subscribe to and uh, we signed on with the uh, local chapter of the NAACP is the 10 shared principles. It's something that the uh, uh, Illinois Association of Chiefs of Police and uh, the state NAACP started uh, about three or four years ago. And there's uh, just 10 shared principles that we all live by and we put into our policy and we talk about with our officers, and, and I won't go through them all, and you, you're more than welcome to look them up on our website. Uh, but number one is we value, the, we value the life of every person and consider it to be the life the highest value. And then number two is treating people with dignity and respect. It's a fundamental value. And I think that when we look at that and expanding upon Chief Wittenauer, it's, it's about officer selection. It's about getting the right person. It's about doing those background checks. It's about doing those psychologicals. It's about making sure we're hiring the right person because it is such an important job and it's an important career to have good officers. It's kind of like doctors. You don't want a bad doctor when you're going in for surgery, do you? You know, you don't want that medical, you don't want that pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical company to have somebody that's not, that's not gonna give you the right, the right medicine. And then it's about creating a culture uh, of, of treating people with dignity and respect. And that's from the training. That's from your FTO process. That's within the organization to maintaining that culture from the top down. And then it's about holding people accountable. It's, it's about making sure that, they're, that they continue to live up to the standards that you've set for them by doing those checks, by checking their L3, or I say L3, by checking their body camera footage, by checking their in-car cameras, to make sure that when they're out there by themselves and they're talking to the public, that they're doing what is part of your mission, is part of our mission, that they're fulfilling that day in and day out. And if they're not, then we hold them accountable. And if we don't hold them accountable, then shame on us. Because then that's on me as a leader of our organization. So, you know, it's, it's tough, but uh, you know, I'm up to the challenge, and I think all these, all these officers are up to the challenge as well. So, Captain, you mentioned in the hiring process, I'm going to uh, refer this question to you. Uh, in the screening process for candidates, is there any sort of uh, bias testing available? So, uh, we do a thorough background investigation uh, where, we, where we talk uh, to family members, relatives, former employers, uh, you know, neighbors, and those are questions that we talk about. Is have you have you ever have you ever witnessed any bias, or have you ever known him to be biased against or prejudiced against anybody for race, religion, sexual orientation? Uh, and then we also put them through a very thorough psychological exam, uh, where that is also talked to by the psychologist, uh, and then uh, with medical screening and stuff like that. Uh, but as far as like a specific test for that, uh, I'm not aware of one specific one, but it is, it is covered in great detail throughout our background and then our psychological. And I don't know if you guys have anything different. I, I can say that I'm sure we all do psych, psychologicals on everyone, whether they, they come in uh, through the entry level program or through a lateral, they, they'll get another psych. Yeah, it's also something our, our whoever's doing our background in-house detectives or otherwise, uh, they do a review of the applicant's social media accounts, uh, historically to look at those, uh, looking for anything out of the ordinary. And also, it's just something that's really harped upon in our in-person interviews and repeatedly brought up. I think our agency, uh, if we're gonna, if, if you make it all the way through our interview process that you've done three uh, in-person interviews by that point with a, a variety of people. Uh, one thing during our background process that would uh, 
jam a bunch of people, not a bunch, but jam some people up and they did the same thing to me where I put down my uh, four references and somebody I didn't put down called me, you know, saying, hey, the state police just met with me and asked all these questions and I'm saying, well, I didn't put you down as a reference. When we create references off of references in my brief time in uh, internal investigations, I did a couple of investigations on troopers or applicants and that's where a lot of the dirt would come out. You know, I'd finish up with their reference and say, hey, who else do you know that knows him or her, a mutual friend? And they'd give me that, I had, you actually had to cre create three references off their references, um, somebody that they did not put down. And usually, you know, half the time is where you, you know, I personally would get some dirt on the person. Thank you. So I have 1531 on my watch, which means it is time to come to a close. We did not get to all the questions from the audience. Uh, there was a lot of questions that came up. Uh, I did the best I could with getting those answered and tying into the discussion. That's why I think we'll have more of these in the future, trying to get the rest of those questions answered. So before I pass over to Colonel Heathman, please join me in showing our gratitude and appreciation for our local law enforcement officers. Thank you again, Chief Whitenauer. Captain Bruggerman, Lieutenant Kitley, Officer Miller, Sergeant Dye, and Senior Ogan. Your presence here is a testament to the trust and commitment between our communities. It is our hope that we continue these events to further bridge the communities, both on and off base. So thank you for being here. Hey, this was, this was awesome. Honestly, and I appreciate, uh, I don't know if you have to be braver in the street, braver in here to take some of these questions, right? This isn't easy. Um, you know, when sh machines break down, we're good at finding the fixes, but these are humanistic problems that, that we deal with each and every day. There's a lot of commonality that, that you brought up in here that, that we absolutely believe, we, we share the same values. Uh, Chief Frizzell and I, we had a, uh, a day where the entire wing stood down to talk about extremism within the military. And we started off that day talking about some of America's most trusted institutions. And it, it's the ones you talked about. It's teachers, military, police is up there. And every time something bad happens in any of those institutions, it's so amplified and it hurts all of our reputation. So uh, I empathize when I hear that because it's something that we talked a lot about on that day. Um, but I like what you said. Kat, you mentioned communication. I, I do believe it always does start there. Um, that's the first place we need to look when things break down is how are we communicating to one another uh, and that's the first place I think we can learn the best from each other um, it was good to know that you have the same problem with social media that I do uh, I, I get a lot of complaints on social media but rarely do they come in and make an appointment to come have coffee with me and talk about my weather calls and shutting down the base or maybe something happens at the BX that they don't like um, I, I joked with one airman one time who, he, he finally did come to talk to me and I said, you know, uh, putting that complaint out there in social media, it's kind of like just going to the parking lot at Walmart and shouting out your problem. There might be a few people that will actually listen to you, but nobody there is going to fix it. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Come in, come talk to us, and I encourage you to do the same thing to your community leaders. Um, part of the real change, uh, and I learned this from Mayor Eastern, who, who's the uh, mayor of East St. Louis, he's, he's my honorary commander. Um, part of that is in if there is a problem, go find the people that actually are responsible for that change and then invest your time. Um, because again, I think you're gonna find a better outcome when you're invested in trying to make something a little bit better and, and, and going to find the right people to talk to because honestly, they, I think they will, they will listen. Uh, and sometimes we tend to lose the art of face-to-face -face communication. It's been very hard this past year too. So uh, Chief and I are, before we came over here, we kept thinking, well, what's next? Um, I, I think more of these conversations, uh, and even inviting you all back to get into our unit levels, um, I'd like to show you some cool stuff here at Team Scott as well. Uh, and not just talk about policing, but maybe show you what we do here and, and invite you all back and, and be a part of our community. Uh, obviously we have Police Week coming up in May and I'm always excited for that week. Uh, we get to spend more time uh, with our first responders, fire and police. Uh, and, and that's a, a good time for again for us to continue conversations. Uh, but again, I welcome you on this space each and every day that, that you want to come out and visit. I know a lot of our units and folks would love to ask more questions and learn from you. I, this was incredible. I got through two or three pages of notes. 
uh, and I appreciate it. Uh, I have a lot of family in law enforcement. Uh, I have a cousin in the Minneapolis Police Department. He's, he's about a year in. Uh, it was either that or Navy SEALs, and I said, boy, uh, I'm not sure you, you picked the right one, uh, but both of them being tough. Um, you know, he, no, he didn't, you know, and uh, so I'm a little upset about that. Uh, I, I wrote about it on Facebook, uh, how upset I was. Uh, now, he's been a little busy, as, as you know. I, it's a big department, though, and I think we talked about smaller departments. It's easier to kind of, you know everybody, um, but he, you know, he doesn't know a lot of the folks that have been involved in these, and he's brand new, and, and uh, he's trying to navigate this, and it's very, it's been very hard for him, too. Uh, I'm good friends with Don Slaznik. Um, you know, he's been a longtime U.S. Marshal. Uh, whose son was an, is an Air Force squadron commander, wasn't a squadron commander, he's graduating now. Um, we got a lot of great leaders in this community and that are connected to this base, and uh, I think we continue to learn from each other quite a bit. So thank you again for your time. Thank you all for your questions. These were some amazing questions, and I think that uh, we did this in a very professional, productive manner, uh, and I really feel like this is the model of the way that we should be doing these things for our for each other. So with that, I hope you have a wonderful and safe rest of your, your week and your time in the force and a lot of years in the force. So thank you for that and, and, I, and I salute you all. All right, thank you.